Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Magesh Panchanathan. I hope you can all hear me well. Perfect, perfect. Hey Tanmay. So I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to maybe make sure everyone's in and uh, you know you can hear me and if there are no any technical issues and then we can go ahead and get started. So today I have a couple of games um, that were given for training games last week for group one and I'm going to be going over those two. And uh, yeah, I just have two very nice instructive games, actually quite popular games. Hopefully some of you have seen it and hopefully when you played your training games, you kind of used it if you are going to purchase training. Uh, if you're not part of purchase training, again, you can learn from these two games and hopefully at some point um, you can always join purchase training. It's a great program that we are running. So let's wait for a couple of minutes. I think there's about a 10 second lag. So if you chat something, I'll try to keep an eye on it. And uh, I mean, we have two games. It should be a short stream, nothing much. I'm probably going to... Um, go over the stuff and of course I will try to answer some questions that you all have uh, to make it a little interactive but uh, it should be pretty straightforward from there okay I guess this is a good um, place to start all right again quickly I'm Grandmaster Magesh Panchanathan and this is a pro chess training um, training game analysis for group one so we are going to go over a couple of positions which are actually given to students to play against each other as part of the, our training program. So this one was the first position that was given and the theme this week was actually um, improving piece positions. So what we do is we pick training games usually based on either that week's topics or the week before or the week after, like something around it. So you're attending some classes, you're learning some ideas and our hope is that you can actually implement it in an actual game and it's not easy you know so sometimes when we put it out um, as a theory and I show you a game and someone's showing you a game it, it's it makes all perfect sense uh, but when you have to implement it in a game it doesn't look that good or easy so that's the reason why I personally love training games a lot and I feel like it's one of the most important part of training regimen because that's the that's the place where you you come really close to what you can find in an actual game right when you sit and think about it at home there's no pressure uh, there's no real life kind of make a move kind of situation yeah all right so let's take a look at this first position this was given um, from white's perspective does anyone recognize this game in chat you can tell me it's a very famous game by two very very strong players looks like we don't have any um, any guesses yet Okay, so this is Nimzovich against Rubinstein. A very, very famous game, particularly for peace maneuvering. And that's the reason we picked this one and decided to give this as a training game. Again, very instructive. I don't know if anyone who played in the game was able to find the first move, which I think is extremely instructive and just beautiful to watch. So if you look at the position, I think my rook... I mean, this is Nimzovich. When I say my, I would say Nimzovich. Nimzovich's rook is in a good place. I think this bishop is also in a good place. So there are a few pieces that can improve. Now, this rook can improve, but it's very easy to improve that. If I double up on the file, I think that's going to be good. I feel like the queen is quite active too, right? I have a beautiful diagonal. Um, I also have a chance to go to the king side. So all of this seems very nice to me. Um, the only two pieces I would say that really need improving are these two. The bishop on d2, the real problem is this pawn, yeah? So I really don't know. I mean, there are places where you could do stuff, but the bishop is actually doing a very important defensive job. Um, so right now, one of the biggest problems uh, for black is this long diagonal. So if I'm looking at this position for um, from uh, black's perspective defensively or to think that what can I take care of, what problems do I have, I would really try to get rid of this bishop. And this knight a5 could be a very useful move for that. But that's where I think this bishop comes into play. 
and I'm continuously keeping an eye on this a5. There's no knight a5. Of course, if there's a real threat, I can do this and go back. But the problem then is I would be allowing some queen uh, getting in or not just the queen, maybe the rook or something like that. So the real problem piece that is not doing much in this position turns out to be this knight. And I don't know if you are all familiar with this. Usually the knight against um, Haywanch, the knight against um, g6 pawn is usually very bad on g3. The same thing. If you're on b3, the b6 pawn will really kill the knight. So this knight can easily be killed with g6 and doesn't seem to have much future. And if I, even if I go knight h5, you play g6, the knight comes back. So someone said, all right, Sai Chris says you played rook fe1. Not a bad move at all. I think rook fe1 is a pretty good move. But the idea that Nimza, which came up with, was basically to reroute the knight. The knight is going to get to a better space. Can someone guess in chat? I don't want to just give it up. You know, I think it's very, very instructive, beautiful to watch. But I want to see if anyone can guess, even if you didn't. Um, is this the game with knight h1? Slow Slav says, is this the game with knight h1? Actually, yes. Knight h1 was the brilliant move played. But where is the knight heading? Who can tell me? Where is the knight actually heading? It's a combination of few pieces that actually make this plan very, very solid. Sometimes I've seen players, um, including myself, create maneuvers where I get a piece to a certain square and then find out nothing is ha really happening. So those kind of situations have been very, um, I mean, it's very much possible, right? We try to reroute our pieces to some place and then it turns out to be nothing. So knight is going to g5, very good. But here's a question for um, for chat. Why, so right now, the knight is on g3 and g6 is really killing the knight. And we are saying this knight should not be on um, g3 because it's really not doing much. But Nimzovich makes a plan to go knight h1, knight f2, and knight, uh, sorry, my arrows are not doing very well. Knight f2 and knight h3. Trying to head to g5. So the only question is, won't this move equally kill that? So I'm going to spend four moves to get, actually one, two, three moves to get to a point where I can reach g5 and black plays h6 and kills it, right? So does anyone, again, I'll give a few seconds to think about this because if you just say, oh, it's beautiful, you did it, um, I don't think we'll be addressing the practical aspects or problems because I can, black can easily play it, so this is where other pieces together come in and really make a difference. Does anyone have any idea? This knight coming to g5 can easily be stopped with one move. I always tell my students, never make a plan for four or five moves when your opponent can stop it in one move. It's a combination of two other things. Hi, Krish, you're right. Queen h5 and g6 becoming weak. Absolutely right. In fact, there are two things together. The main contribution is the bishop. I think the bishop being here makes this plan extremely, extremely uh, dangerous for black. Why? Because when my knight is on h3, you play h6, I can actually still play this. If you take, I will simply checkmate you with queen h5. So as long as I may, my bishop is still there, this plan works beautifully, right? So this is why, again, you have to understand plans with context, right? So watch what happens. Let's go on with the game and see what happens. So knight h1 was played. So knight's coming all the way to g5. Bishop d7 was played, knight f2, rook e8 challenge, and then rook fe1 was played. So basically, Nimzovich has all good pieces. This one is doing a defensive job, and this one's about to go to the most threatening position on g5. And if it reaches g5, it's a real problem, yeah? So your rook takes, rook takes, and um, knight to d8 was played. I guess, again, makes a lot of sense because black is trying to um, defend f7 if the knight goes to g5. But... All along, black has no way to deal with this bishop. And that's the real problem, yeah? I really cannot deal with this bishop. If if black could have somehow found a way to change this, I think this whole plan would have collapsed and black would have been completely fine. In fact, black has a lot more space on the center and uh, black would have nothing to worry about it. So even though knight's, knight is creating the deadly threat, the bishop is the one that's causing the real damage, yeah? So knight d8 was played, knight h3. And here, uh, according to Nimzovic's analysis, this is where the actual mistake happened, bishop c6, which is correct, yeah? I mean, these days, you can check it with the computer as well. And uh, bishop b5 is suggested as the only defensive idea. I think the main 
reason behind this is to keep an eye on um, this this pawn. Ah, why not queen c8, bishop e6? That's an interesting question. So knight to d8. The problem is you just don't have enough time, uh, Sai. Because I'm guarding this e6 square with the rook and the bishop. So this is the problem. And also, you cannot really even challenge. Watch this. Let's say you go something like this. Like rook takes, bishop takes. You want to play bishop to f7. But the problem is now you run into moves like this. And serious threats, serious threats. I mean, you'll completely be on the defensive. It will be very difficult for you to get back. So, for example, if you play, you have to play knight e7, I think. That's like the only move. And let's say I put my queen on e6 or something. Um, I feel the position has become extremely defensive. Maybe there's still some chance with queen d7. Maybe I can play queen d7 here. So let's go back and see if rook e8, do I have to take it? Ah, actually, I'm, I'm missing a pawn, free pawn, my bad. Yeah, free pawn, yeah. Um, let me go back. So Sai is taking just in time for after knight d8. The problem is you don't have time, yeah? Because when you play this, I go knight g5 and I have one more on e6. So literally you just needed one more move to achieve this. If the knight was on h3 by this time, Yep, you could have done that. Hey, Harsh. But unfortunately, just one move too short, yeah? So let's go back. Um, yeah, so bishop b5 was the correct move. And the idea is to keep an eye on this pawn. Basically, counterplay. So when your opponent has a plan, and if you don't do much, you will get rolled over. That's basically what happened. Um, it is just that at this particular point, black had to create something substantial which would be this pressure on d3. If, so for example, the analysis goes like this, knight f7 now, also keeping an eye on this. And if queen, um, okay, rook e1, bishop c6, and again bishop b5. So this is the way to keep pressure. So I kick the queen out, and I'm again attacking the pawn. So now um, you have to really, really defend the pawn. Or you can play some g3 and give up the pawn, and the assessment is still equal. White can attack. Um, the assessment still turns out to be equal. So, going back, I'm not going to go too much into the analysis. I'm just going to show you what happens when black plays passively. Bishop c6. I mean, bishop c6 is not technically a passive move. It's I'm activating the bishop, but the problem is that long diagonal doesn't seem to do much at all, right? Uh, d3 is not really an important pawn, sorry. What it is, is it's just some counter chance. White cannot achieve everything at zero cost. That's what black has to try to do, right? You have to give me, make me pay some price then it becomes a very reasonable, challenging struggle. I would be like, okay, I'm giving up a pawn for achieving this. And if you were able to defend it or deal with it, then you will have an extra pawn. So if you look at the game, look at what happens. What happens? Queen h5 happens and queen h4. And now knight g5, well, actually, knight g5 is possible, but he's hitting the pawn on d4 beautifully. And he will make the bishop relocate. So he'll play b4. Since the pawn is hanging, the bishop needs to go back. And now go back. So he's doing the same thing, Nimzovich, and he's creating this, uh, the bishop has gone. So the kingside defense has become very weak. So that's a beautiful queen f2, queen h4. Again, subtle things. And now, after rook e8, rook e5, the knight really goes to g5. It's very difficult to deal with that. So for example, now it's a forcing sequence. Bishop takes f7, queen takes f7, knight g5. Now I'm hitting both these queen and the pawn, and the queen had to go to g8. I mean, the rest now is quite straightforward, yeah? Because now the theme of the game has become king safety. And this keeps happening in your games. You have to remember that. You will start with something. You will be doing something when it will keep changing. So now the king safety is really going to de decide the game. And uh, rook takes, bishop takes, and queen e1. I think at this point is almost game over. Because I cannot stop queen e5 or queen e7 at the same time. And once I achieve this, it's going to be a real problem. So bishop c6 was played. I'll just show you the game. Yeah, I don't think it's that big a deal anymore. King h8. And uh, actually, again, <laughs> I feel like he did a nice thing here. He brought in one last piece into the game. b5. So I guess the idea is the bishop com is coming into game. Um, so after, let's say... Actually, what is the purpose of b5? I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. So why not knight e6 here with the idea of queen f6? Let's just explore this a little bit. I don't remember exactly the end of this game. So I'm going to explore this with you guys. So knight e6 with the idea of queen f6 looks pretty strong. 
um, the bishop will never participate that's one thing let's see what happens here ah that's right i guess i will still keep running i mean it's still not over i mean i'll play something like h5 or h6 or actually h5 check here as a pawn was an h6 knight f8 will win the game um yeah if the pawn was an h6 knight f8 check will win the game so now check here and i'm still kind of hanging in there this is where this beautiful b5 comes in so let's go back what nimzovich is doing is again probably still continuing the theme of relocating um, a nice piece b5 takes if you take now the same sequence knight e6 check you have to go here check you have to go here and bishop b4 and you have to resign so uh, again three pieces on the board beautifully coordinating all pieces right b5 is a very nice touch to the position okay after b5 queen g7 was played queen takes king takes pawn takes yeah i'm not going to show anything any further this is a quite straightforward loss for black down a piece so i hope this is a very instructive um lesson nimzovich against rubinstein played in 1926 in dresden um you can pull up the game and uh, see the whole game for the perspective but i think the beauty of this game is simply relocating one piece from h1 g3 to the right place on g5 and seal the deal right now let's look at the second game I'm glad Harsh that you are enjoying it. Um actually uh, before I move on let me say if there's any questions in this game. What is the best reply to NH1? Actually objectively this is still equal yeah. So knight h1 bishop d7 was okay. So black's real mistake happened here. Rook e8 takes takes. Knight d8 was also okay. And here like we talked about bishop c6 was a mistake. Because I think black had to play bishop b5 <coughs> and keep some cost for white right white had to give up this d3 pawn <clears throat> so now rook e1 now the main move bishop c6 followed by bishop b5 bishop c6 bishop b5 saying how do you defend the pawn so you have to concede something so if you play something like g3 bishop takes d3 and it still says white's maybe slightly better but this still keeps bishop takes f7 let me just go with the analysis queen takes queen takes rook takes and rook e6 i'm not sure if i 100% uh, percent know this exact um Uh, i'm not verified this particular thing with a computer uh, this is part of the chess base analysis that i'm working with so um, i'm not going to completely quote on this but this seems to be the variation that you should um, he should have played okay so let's go on to the next game load next game all right this one is my favorite one of my favorites i actually gave this position from a different starting point usually i don't know if anyone recognizes this game can anyone tell me from chat um who played this position let's see uh the pgn on the website is still not there chess content so the pgn for all the class content is already there for the training games we still don't have it yet we are going to we are planning to do that it will come there shortly um that's the reason we were also doing this video here so we want all of you to see this uh we'll definitely have that soon colson uh, actually no <laughs> but good guess i think colson would have definitely played something like this if at all in modern era someone can repeat it um oh you played it from black okay slow slav is saying karpo that's right this is karpo anzikar 1974 an olympiad match and yep that's exactly correct this game was actually more famous for an earlier move where karpo avoids trades so these two rooks in the open file and there will be a queen on b7 or if i or like the bishop on b7 i don't remember um or, or maybe not even that that queen on e8 rook on c8 and rook on e8 would be there i don't have the game to go back right now so i'm just going to not go back but karpo would play this beautiful move bishop a7 like out of nowhere and uh, this inspired me because i had a game where i did this several i mean this is some years ago uh, probably 4 years ago where i had a relopus game same structure similar theme where i was dominating with extra space and i could play this move bishop a7 and i was very happy to play it um oh pardon me for the arrows because the whole idea would be to avoid trades he would have extra space on the board and he would really 
say, okay, I don't want to trade pieces and black could be totally crammed with all these extra pieces with not enough space to go to. So that's usually more famous in this game, but I, I picked this one now for the finish. From here on until the end of the game, Carpo does nothing but improve his pieces. This is just very instructive in my opinion because um, he, he basically says, okay, I'm already in a great position and this is what you should recognize sometimes is when you have an advantage, you have all the time, particularly in a position like this, you have all the time. Black is literally doing nothing but wait. So black can keep on waiting and any move that black does, which is a little rash, could be a weakness. So black might not want to do that. So black has to literally just wait. So watch what happens in the game. He basically improves every single piece, but the most important piece turns out to be this one, right? Actually, before I make the move, where would you like this bishop to go? Let's see who can tell me in chat. Where would you like this bishop to go? I don't know if anyone played this kind of an idea in your training game. I would be very happy to hear if you did. It would be excellent. Bishop is going to h5. Very nice. You know what? That's the one trade I don't mind. I don't want to trade pieces in general, but I do not mind trading the light squared bishop. Well, if I get to e6, it'll be really good. I don't think I have a real path, realistic chance to get to e6. I mean, e6 is just a real dream position. Unfortunately, it might not be easy, but I could go to h5 and trade this bishop. And then imagine all the light squares. They're like super weak because this bishop is pretty much like a pawn sitting in front of all these pawns, right? So that's it. That's all happens in this game. Bishop comes to c2. Bishop d1, knight g3, bishop h5 was the plan. And that's exactly what he executed. Now, black could have probably played h5 at some point. But I don't think black can really defend that pawn. So I'll tell you what the problem is. Let's try it, yeah? So let's say you play h5. And I could play knight g3 first as well. So at some point, I'll kind of force you to do this. The thing is, if I open up the king side, I think black is dead. So black needs to keep the position closed. Right, that's kind of obvious. And if I force you to play h4, then I think you have no way, actually, let me go to f1, probably slightly better option. Um, there is no way to stop this now. And then this pawn trade will happen. And there is no way to stop this after that. So the position just opens up. And uh, black just cannot do that. So Sai is asking, isn't the light square, light square bishop equally bad? Yes, I think black's all pieces are bad. But I think at this point, light square weakness is, is what Karpo was going for, which I think is very, very instructive. So again, black could have tried to play this h5 idea, but it just really opens up the king side, like I said. So eventually he didn't do anything. So he just waited. But again, it became super instructive and super easy for Karpo. Now, again, black could have stopped this with one more move, but it wouldn't change much because I will simply go bishop e2 or bishop e2 probably, and then I will play queen d1. And this is going to happen no matter what. So this trade is only way possible to stop this trade is to play h5 on black's own. But that, like I just showed you, is going to really force h4 and open up the position so much. So black played h6, bishop h5, queen e8, queen d1 and just like we planned everything is happening this h6 move probably was not required i think this is a little bit more of a weakness but at some point if white played h4 i could have maybe forced that a little bit so maybe that's a minor inaccuracy but again he improves even this rook this is the kind of play for karpo yeah? rook a3 and rook a2 i mean you might not even see what the big deal is but this queen can go to a1 and triple up he might not even be doing it right now and he doesn't do that right now but he's ready for it. And that's the beauty of this game, yeah? Why do I have to initiate anything? When I could improve my pieces three with three more moves, I will play everything in my best square. And this is what Karpo's brilliancy was, right? And I'm pretty sure most players here, and including me, right? Sometimes we rush into our clans. We're like, we have a great position. Okay, let's go for it. Bishop takes up seven, knight h5, queen g4, h4. I mean, we have an active plan. Why don't we start doing it? No. Because black literally has no moves. And he improves the rook's position. He goes rook a3. He goes rook a2. Sometime in the future, maybe queen a1 will happen. So he's ready for that, right? 
just wait a bit around and black gets tired. That's a good point too. Actually, that's also an important thing. When you play slow, it's very, very frustrating. Imagine playing as black hit. I would hate this. And I'd be sitting there suffering. I would be looking for opportunities. Every move you play where you don't give me an opportunity is suffering for me. So if you make me suffer longer, very high chances that I'm also going to mess up something, right? So knight g4 happened. Now it's a tactical thing. I cannot take on h5 because after queen takes h5, there's a discovered check. So the queen is still guarding h5. So king f8, and he's improving his knight's position to e3 from there. And finally the trade happens, and now queen comes in. So what happens if queen captures? Let's see if there is anything important. I think probably still queen h5, yeah? Maybe I can trade queens. The thing is, once I trade queens at some point, this is going to... And the rook can probably get in. What do you guys think? Queen f7, should I play bishop b6 directly? I could play bishop b6 or I could play queen h5. I'm trying to figure out what is it. Srinivas, yes. Um, you just got here. We are reviewing group 1 training games. That's right. We finished the first game. If you missed it, don't worry about it. This will be a video in our um, YouTube channel. You can always watch watch it. But we are looking at the second game. This was played by Karpo and Zikar. Yeah, if black could sacrifice something in the center and create some activity, yes, possible. But in this position, it's very unlikely. So yeah, I think just content is saying Queen H5. Let's try Queen H5. Maybe Queen H5 will happen. And if you trade, Knight takes. How do, we, how do I break through though? That's kind of important here, yeah? What does... So let's say I play king f7. The only thing I'm worried about is if I play bishop b6, you will play rook takes, rook takes and rook a8. Ah, you cannot play rook a8 because this is hanging. So yeah, bishop b6 is good enough. Now the rook will come in. And uh, the beauty is this knight will go here also. <laughs> I mean, max, talk about maximizing peace positions. White is just maximizing everything. Karpo is like ruthless here. Okay, in the game, knight takes f7 was played. Queen h5, knight d8, and he played queen to g6, even more of a killer. Um, because you might think this pawn is very weak, but the thing is, black has no way to access it once the knight sits on f5. Look at the simple problems, yeah? So let's say I put my knight on f5. All you have to do is if you bring this knight to e7, you could get the pawn. Um, or if you bring the knight to f8, you can get the pawn. But the lack of space clearly tells you. The knights cannot get to e7 or f8 or h8. These, these are just squares I cannot reach. And that's because of lack of space. So after queen g6, king f8 and knight h5, actually black just resigned. I mean, I'm literally forcing queen takes g6. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, it's one of my favorite games. I think it's very beautifully executed and Karpo is one of my favorite players. The The reason I love his game is the amount of control he keeps on the game, which is probably a very important thing. Right? From the starting point, White didn't have to do anything extra. Just improve the pieces to the right squares, particularly the bishop on b1. So that was good. Let's see if you, anyone has any questions in this game. I can right now maybe answer some questions if you if you have some. If not, I think we did really well. This video will be there in our channel. You can always rewatch it. And I would recommend looking through both the games. The first one was uh, Nimzovic against Rubinstein Dresden. And this one is Karpo Anziker from the Olympiad in 1974. So um, we will try to add some PGNs for training games in your PCT dashboard. So you can actually review them there. Um, but for now, the videos are here. You can look through the games. Um, Chessbase actually has annotated versions of, I, I think, both the games. You can definitely look through that. How did Black get into this last position? Well, that would be a different kind of a theme to discuss. But, I mean, there was, uh, there are some Ray Lopez positions, Ray Lopez positions where you have the structure. The spawn structure is possible, but um, it's, I mean, Black misplayed it, obviously. <laughs> you cannot get into this kind of a situation. And, be, be in a position where you have zero plan. Um, 
Slow Slav in US chess school. Okay, thank you. I didn't. Uh, I'm glad you're there as well. So fantastic. I do teach. I think I actually have a lesson coming about uh, on this this Friday, if I remember right, with US chess school on Bobby Fischer. So uh, yes, Siddhant, I am watching the chat. Hi. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe give Karpo versus Kasparov. Wow, chess content. You already know <laughs> the position. It won't be as much fun. I mean, it is still good. If you know a certain position and a certain game, I still think it's instructive because uh, I believe some amount of repetition is required for us to really um, register a theme. We do this in tactics all the time. Right? We kind of, we don't do just one pin to learn what pin is and then move on and say, I'm done. We do lots of exercises, right? The same way regrouping pieces or improving any theme you have, it's actually not bad to repeat some of them. Um, I will try, so this is what I would like. I would like to give you a position where you don't know exactly this is the move, this is the plan and be done with it. I want you to just kind of try it. And um, yeah, I mean, if you know the plan, then you're actually learning about how to execute it. If you don't know the plan, you're kind of figuring it out. Either ways, I think you're going to benefit from those things. So I'll try to pick games um, based on that week's lecture. That's what I would be doing in general. All right, so I guess that's pretty good. This could be a good place for us to wrap up. I'll again, um, give a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. If not, it was fun. We plan to do this on a regular basis and um, hopefully, you know, we'll see more and more of you um, because if you play your training games, which I really recommend you should, uh, even if you miss the tournament, you should definitely try to play the training games. We spend time picking these positions based on the lectures from the week. So you, you it, it is really meant to uh, make you work on that angle. So definitely try to do that and definitely watch the video, if not the live stream, to make sure you know what the themes and what the actual analysis of the position are, right? All right, thank you everyone. I'll see you next week. Uh, group two, three, and four, we are still figuring it out. Ramesh at some point might do something like this. He might post a video. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll put it out. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the stream in about 30 seconds. All right.